Welcome to Every Night is Game Night, your home for heavy strategy, awesome theme, and everything in between. Check us out, along with other great podcasts, at Dicetowernetwork.com. Hey everybody, welcome back to Every Night's Game Night. This is Anthony once again with Jason. Yo, my peoples, what's up? And once again with us, we have The Brant from the Portal Gaming Podcast. Hello, I'm glad to be back again. Thank you for having me. Yes, we're talking about Root this week. And that's it. That's it. We're talking about Root, we're talking about Root, we're talking about Root. Game of the year, guys, what do you think? It's definitely very popular. Yeah, yeah, it's up there right now. It's up there right now. I mean, people are playing it. It was a, the, the hottest thing of Gen Con. It wasn't even like we saw it coming. It wasn't like a meteor we saw from the sky. I'm just like waiting for it to land. It just kind of like got landed and people played it and played it and played it. And it was like very organic. You know, uh, people, once people got into it, people were just, whoa, this is crazy, you know? Uh, so we're going to get into that. We're going to get into um, just root, root, root. Uh, we'll do a little bit of a deep dive in terms of just focusing a lot, uh, you know, talking about it a little bit. And then... Uh, we have a really awesome treat for you guys. Uh, Cole Worley, who is the designer of the game, uh, is going to come on for an Improve Your Play segment. He's going to break down strategy, overall strategy, dominance wins, how to win with each faction, how to beat each faction. Uh, he, he, as soon as I uh, reached out to him and I said, uh, you guys want to, you want to talk strategy? He's like, all right, I'm in. <laughs> I'm tired of talking about this other stuff. I want to talk how to win. So we had a lot of fun with him. Also had a, some help from a friend, a local guy, Harrison. He joined me on the podcast as well. So we're going to put that at the back end of the episode, even though it's probably going to be way longer than we're going to go here. Uh, so yeah, we're, you're going to get a lot of root for this episode. But first, uh, we are going to get to Liz. Liz, tell us about another awesome Kickstarter. Hey, gamers. This is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here to encourage your Every Night is Game Night acquisition disorder. This week, I want to talk about the Stygian Society. This game is a cooperative dungeon crawl designed by Kevin Wilson of Descent and Arkham Horror fame. It's deliberately constructed to encourage cooperation among players. A large part of the game is sacrificing yourself to help boost others, making sure that you power up your teammates rather than just focusing on yourself. That ought to be strategically and thematically interesting. This game is set in 1800s Austria, and heroes will fight their way, floor by floor, to the top of a wizard's tower. You can get the base game for $54, or the base game and the expansion for $75. Shipping will be determined at a future date. If you're looking for a cooperative dungeon crawl that truly emphasizes cooperation and synergy among players, the Stygian Society may be the game for you. Happy gaming! All right, so Liz, thank you very much. That was not Root on Kickstarter. Hopefully it was a game that will uh, hit as hard as that uh, because Root was Kickstarted, and I'm kind of kicking myself for not backing that. So, oh, well. Did you back it, Anthony? No, no, I picked it up at Gen Con. Not a backer? Not a backer? No. You know, and there's some people out there that's like, man. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it seems kind of hard to get right now. That You know, that print run's going to go fast. We have some at the portal. There it is. Oh, okay. So before we get going, uh, I promised Brent that we would, uh, he would, I let him plug some stuff. So Brent, uh, plug the Portal Gaming Store and plug the podcast. Yeah. So we do a podcast called the Portal Game Podcast, which is also part of the Dice Tower Network. And uh, it's very often myself. Uh, and then I have two co hosts, Brian, who is the manager of the store, and Kathy, who is an avid gamer and also my beautiful wife. Uh, and uh, we talk about games, we talk about the store and just the community around a store. Uh, more than like the business end and the ins and outs. And then the store is The Portal, which is in Manchester, Connecticut. And uh, that's www.timemachineportal.com. It's on Facebook, The Portal. And then you can tweet at me, at PortalGaming60 on Twitter. The important part being that you can get root there. Quick well, quick before. <laughs> yeah, they might be gone yeah. now. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. So, Anthony, um, let's, let's set the table. Tell us a little bit about how it plays. All right, let's do it. Yeah, like you said, Cole Worley, designer. He's he's kind of known for his big heavy stuff, uh, John Company and Infamous Traffic, Pax Pamir. So this one was, it, it, when I remember when it was first announced, I was like, huh, 
That's interesting. This is like a cutesy, like fuzzy animal game, but it's also a war game. So I guess that's kind of the back door here is this is a war game. It reminds me a little bit of the coin series, uh, that whole counterinsurgency series of games from GMT where you have asymmetric people kind of fighting for different objectives, but it's much simpler and more accessible than that. Um, the asymmetry here is on very clear display, uh, but unlike Vast, which is the first game uh, from Leader Games, which was Notorious Nightmare to Teach, uh, Root is relatively straightforward. Uh, most of what you need to know is printed on your player board. You can get people into the game in 15, 20 minutes and learn as you go. Very, very easy and quick to get started with compared to some of the other asymmetrical games out there, um, and especially compared to like big, heavy war games. But the the main draw here, the thing that everybody knows about it, is that you have every single character you could play is different, like significantly different. They have different objectives, different ways of earning points, different cards, different stuff they're going to do throughout the game, and even like different levels of difficulty for handicapping for new players. So you have the Mar- Marquis de Cat, which is the, uh, I guess, de facto bad guys here. They're trying to take over the woods, sucking up all the resources. And how they play is they build workshops, they build mills, they build barracks. You basically win by building stuff and crafting goods. So when you build something, you score points. And when you craft goods, you score points. And you'll be hopefully generating enough stuff and putting up enough workshops out that you can build whatever you want. The airy, these are the birds. Um, this is one of my favorites. Uh, this is one where you create this tableau of cards that is basically a programmed action pool. And you run through and you activate each of the cards one at a time. And you keep adding cards to that so you get more actions every round until you get to a point where you can't actually do it. And then you have to reset. So they, basically it's like their government collapses <laughs> it thematically. And you have to pull them all back, restart, pick a new leader, which means slightly different um, starting points. The Alliance, this is the uh, the insurgency that is fighting against the Marquis de Cat. So beginning of the game, they're not even on the map. They're recruiting. They're getting people to sympathize. They're putting tokens on the board and then eventually raising armies. So they kind of have this curve where at the beginning they're not there at all. But by the end, they could be very powerful if people don't do anything about it. And then the Vagabond, which my is favorite. this. It's my dude. Yeah, the Vagabond is awesome. So it's just one little character. He runs around the map and he does pretty much whatever he wants, doesn't really care about anything else that's going on. He'll help anybody. Uh, his job is to turn... To, when other people get items, he'll trade cards for them to get those items. Those items would give him actions. So the more items you have, the more actions you take. You can explore ruins. You can do all sorts of cool stuff, complete quests to generate points. Um, this is another one where if people leave him alone too long, also will run away with the game. So <laughs> um, that's kind of the very basics of the game. Uh, we'll going to run through what we all think of it but i know uh uh, brant you've you've been playing the expansion too right yeah so the expansion comes with a second vagabond so you can have two vagabonds running around Uh, it comes with two other factions so there's the river folk which are otters and they're really interesting Uh, the river folk play with their hand face up and on the table and they're basically trying to sell the whole game So you have to be a very vocal player and a very trustworthy person because it could be possible that if this was like the well-known trader of the group that nobody would trust them and buy from them. So they're kind of interesting. Uh, There's also the Lizard Cult Faction. The Lizard Cult Faction is interesting and what's unique is that all discarded cards go to them. And then last, uh, it contains a like solo and co-op mode. So the cats get uh, replaced by the mechanical cats. And you have, actually, it comes with um, card holders, and you put cards backwards that you can't see, kind of in a line, and then you pull one from the queue, and that card determines, like, where the cats are going to move. And they're basically just trying to spread out, and they score points for clearings they rule, and then you're playing with whatever number of factions, one to four or five, however you play co-op, trying to push them back so that they can't score points. Um so it's it's an interesting soul and cope. I haven't got a lot of opportunities to play it, but it definitely helps you to learn each faction. So that's probably my favorite thing to solo play is to learn games. So it's great for me, but for others, I'm not sure. I'd have to see uh, in terms of where all that goes. And did you, did you play solo, Anthony? I have not yet had a chance. No, I've uh, I have. I have the expansion, and I have played with the lizards, I believe. Yeah. Um, 
but have not got a chance to put the solo out yet. And mm-hmm. uh, I want to. It was one of those things like, like how many more rules is the solo? And you're like, ah, it's a few pages. I'll come back to this. So it <laughs> hasn't right. happened yet. But I mean, yeah. I've played the heck out of the game, you know, with my game group. I, okay, so compared to Vast, like why did this game hit so much harder than the Vast? And Cole's going to allude to it. You'll hear that in the section coming up. Um, so Vast, notoriously difficult game to teach. I mean, a cool theme, but not like a theme that really drew you in. You know, it's like, oh, you can play the dragon or you can play the cave. And that sounds interesting on a high level. It doesn't like, I don't get this visual joy of like, I'm going to play a cave now. Uh, so that there wasn't quite that draw. And then it was just the interactions were kind of like, okay, this will interact with that person. This will act with this person. There's not that cross table kind of, you know, thing going on. Not so much. I mean, yeah, you, a little bit, but not, not nearly as much as here. Here, everybody interacts with everybody. I think you'd agree with that, right? Yeah. Like um, the the Vagabond, which is, like I was saying before, my favorite character. This is my favorite play style. I don't care about like area control or who's doing what. I just want to like stick and move and, you know, uh, sneak around and all that kind of thing. So like they, they interact with everybody. They can trade with everybody. Uh, the cats have the, the dominance of the board, so they have to see what the Woodland Alliance is doing and see what the birds are doing. Uh, and the birds, they they don't. You have to, like Anthony was saying, you have to you know follow a track of stuff. You have to like you know you have to build and you have to attack and you have to move, and therefore you're going to be intruding on everybody's spaces. You know, uh, the, the interaction is so high, and really like they found a way to make it like simple. Like it's it's simple yet rewarding. It's not like like we, we talked in the last episode about the heavy games and having barriers. Like there's not a huge barrier here. Like it manages to deliver a very rich experience without a huge barrier. Like wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I, I had heard this one was a little bit easier to get into, but I was still surprised when I pulled it out for the first time to learn it and I was like, huh, this rule book's pretty small. This is this is pretty straightforward. And I have played some of these bigger, heavier, more complicated war games with flow charts and spreadsheets to teach you how, how to run each you know, each of the different um, characters you're playing with. And I was just amazed that he managed to boil everything down into such basic core elements. And yet it's not a simple, it doesn't make it a light game. There's still a lot to think through and a lot to do. And that's, it's just so impressive. Yeah. Like the heavy cardboard people uh, mentioned that, wow, this is actually, there's some meat here. And when they're saying that, (laughs) you know that there's a lot going on. (laughs) Yeah, so I can only yeah. imagine vast hit with a bang, but I felt like at the end of the day, what you were saying was a little rock, paper, scissors going on, and vast didn't feel as much like a competition as it did like an adventure or just a story. Like it was just a fun thing to do, but the competitiveness wasn't always there. Right. But they put the formula together here. I mean, no joke. They pulled in Cole and that multi use card play from Pax Premier and just that expertise, and then, you know. They have no bones about saying they pulled in the coin system, you know, from all these counterinsurgents games from GMT, and they pulled that in, and I mean, what they concocted is just, it's perfect. It's exactly what they're going for. Now, it's interesting, the game gets all the ray from its asymmetry, but I think actually what makes the game work and accessible is the similarity that they put in that Vast didn't have. Right. So in this game, right. everybody's trying to score 30 points. Everybody moves the same way. Everybody's trying to craft items and th- then do whichever with them. Yeah. Everybody's drawing from the same deck of cards. Uh, so there's so many similarities that you're able to teach and kind of see some of those. It allows the asymmetries to shine, mm-hmm. you know? And that, to me, is what I love about something like Gaia Project, where everybody's trying to do the same thing, but the asymmetry of those makes you do it a different way. Mm-hmm. So I feel like that's where they succeeded so well above Vast. Yeah, it's not like literally playing four different games. You're playing the same game, but you're all you're approaching it from wildly different ways, which is kind of what you want from really any war game, but especially one that's meant to be this accessible is that's how it is. Everybody has a different perspective, a different thing they're trying to do. It, like the victory condition for the cats is obviously going to be different than for the alliance, and so the mechanics to get to victory should be different. But the way in which you do those things is going to be the same because of course it is. Um Another thing I really like is that you have these four different <laughs> options, and if you're playing with a new player, for example, you know you can give them the cat or the vagabond and be like, oh, you just do this, and you know the interaction is this. 
Um, or if you want to handicap the game, you can to some degree, because some of these are a little bit more complicated to play, but not like vastly more complicated to play. So I it see gives... what you did there. Uh, yeah. Oh, there it is. Uh, nice. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't on you purpose, did. but yeah, I'll take oh. it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, like when I'm playing for the first time with somebody, I'm like, okay, well, here's the cats. This is all they do. You get these three actions. This is how you get an extra one. You're just building stuff and fighting stuff. <laughs> That's what you want to do. Very simple. Or you don't want to worry too much about the interaction. Here's the vagabond. You run around. You collect items. You do cool stuff. But you don't have to get into fights unless you really want to. Um, it it's, gives a lot of different ways to play the game and different styles of play. But again, within the same context and the same core mechanisms, which is really cool. So this has been a love fest so far, and I, I think we all agree this is an excellent game. I, I, you, if you if you at all like war games or you're curious about a war game, this is entry level stuff. The theme is awesome. The component, everything is just awesome. Artwork, yeah, everything is just you know, a graphic design is clean. The the boards are clear. The you know, um, the boards do a lot of work. The play, individual player boards, but I didn't think it was overwhelming. So like you have your whole turn is listed on your player board and your resources and if you're yeah you, know, you have pieces that die that's all in front of you but it, i didn't i never felt overwhelmed by all that like everything is cool do we have anything that leaps out in terms of a criticism or uh something that was a little bit rough for us i have two so the first one is i actually think that learning how the other players play is not overly difficult while you're playing the game but the special powers that everybody has are really important, and it that just doesn't come across players till like rounds three and four. So, for example, the Woodland Alliance has the ability where when you attack them, they take the higher die roll, and that's mm-hmm. super important to know. But people just don't read those special powers to each other, and even if you read them all off at the beginning of the game, nobody comprehends them. So that still has a little barrier for people, but that's a small. Now, I've had a lot of people tell me they love it at two. Um, I didn't have the best two-player game, but I played the Eerie and completely botched them and got run over, so that's all but my fault. Um, You know, the solo play I kind of alluded to before. And then I played it at six with four new players and the two new factions for the first time, and the game was pushing three hours. Mm-hmm. I also Oof. spilled a beer all over my copy, but <laughs> oh no! <laughs> but it survived. So way to go, Leader Games! It's completely fine. So it even can take beer assault. Um, but uh, yeah, so you know that's going to be a thing to know. The sweet spot is absolutely four players. That four player base is totally where the sweet spot of the game is. So they nailed it when they knew which four to put in the box. But the scaling, I think, could be a little tough. Mm-hmm. I think uh, for me, like. I- Okay, I don't really have anything bad to say. I haven't played it a ton. Uh, I just, like, every time I do play it, though, I, I like it more. It's an asymmetrical game, but you almost want the players to be at the same level with the game. Because it's really rough when one person kind of knows the game and everybody else is kind of learning. That person has such an advantage. And they know, like, you know, to be aggressive and set the pace. And they know certain things about the game. And... Like, and that's every game. Like, you know, you're going to get thrashed in any Euro game by the person who knows it if they're not holding back and anything. But, like, this one felt very defeating when you're, you know, they're just, like, because you could really get rolled in this game. And that's a very defeating experience. So, like, and I, I don't even think that's a fault of the game. I just think that's a that's just kind of a part of the package of an asymmetrical, hard-to-learn or hardish-to-learn game. Uh, so that was my only negative, really. Like, I mean, I haven't played the solo in co-op. The solo sounds like a learning experience. More, you know, it sounds like it was kind of a thing that was put in there after the fact. Same with Vast. Uh, Vast was designed as a four or five player game, and the solo was just kind of in there to learn and stuff. So I'm not going to evaluate that one too much. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm I'm over the moon. I, I really, really, really dig, dig this game. Yeah, I think I'm in the same boat as you guys. Like, I love this. It's just... Like we said at the beginning, this is one of my games of the year. Uh, I haven't sat down and looked through my list, but it's definitely way up there in the top of the list. Uh, I I think my main issue is the same as both of yours. It's the player counting issue. Is The game is ideal at four. Anything other than that, you're making some sacrifices, whether it's length or the balance. Not, not that it's imbalanced, but just the way things play against each other. Like 
these things are it's designed to play with those four races kind of balancing each other out and working against each other in, in these different ways. And so when you adjust that, and the game adjusts for them all fairly well, I mean, I haven't had a bad experience, but it's not ideal experience either. So bringing this to game night, if you have groups of three, I'm like, eh, let's do something else. Um, so you definitely want an ideal group. And then, like you said, if, you know, I've played this now, you know, six, seven, eight times, I don't remember exactly how many, but enough that when I'm playing with someone new, I have to severely down... Yeah, shift. you really got to tie one hand. Where in another game, people have played Euro, people have played, you know, co-ops or whatever, they, they'll, you'll get it and you'll be competitive. You may win, but the uh, the new player will be competitive. In this game, it's very hard <laughs> to be competitive when a person know, knows what they're doing. You know, the do not give the least conflict per the person who likes conflict the least the woodland alliance because <laughs> people oh, yeah. have alluded like they're like the terrorists of the forest because they just boom they pop up and destroy everything in a space like every turn yeah you said the the cats were the bad guys those woodland alliance man <laughs> <They're pretty rough. laughs> it's intense well from the narrative perspective they're the bad guys i don't know <laughs> So I'll throw it out there. It's a 10 out of 10. Whoa! Free candy Whoa! for all. <laughs> I, I don't have a problem rating games 10. So I, I know that somewhere on Twitter recently, there was somebody said, like, how many 10s? And I'm like, I'll rate my top 20 games as 10. Like, I don't have an issue. I can understand. So if you want to call it a 9.5, because I said there's a few drawbacks, that's fine. But I, it, the game is phenomenal. The components, the artwork, the gameplay, the teach... The satisfaction, the asymmetry, the similarities, it's its awesome. So definitely in consideration for Game of the Year for me, 10 out of 10. It's an 8 out of 10 for me only because I haven't played it more. I, if I play it more, I get into it more. Same thing happened with Spirit Island. Spirit Island was good, um, but as I played it more, just got it went up and up and up. Now it's like a 9. If I played even more, expansion's coming, it might hit, you know, that. So I assume, Anthony, you're on the same page? Yeah, I think so. I think I rated it a little bit higher, like an 8.5, like when I updated it on my uh, profile. But yeah, no, I love this game. Uh, definitely a buy. All right. So uh, you've heard us gush about this game. Hopefully you learned a lot about how it plays. Do you want to play well at this game? Let's hear the advice of the designer, Cole Worley, right now. All right. Uh, so this is Jason here. Uh, you have just heard Anthony break down Root. Uh, obviously, you know, we all love the game. It's a really, really cool game. Uh, we thought it was definitely worth the improve your play treatment. This is a heavy game, and it's a game that you can really lose very, very easily, especially if you knew you don't know what you're doing. So we think of this as like a public service for you guys to get some access to the game, get a real foothold, uh, start not just playing, but playing well. Uh, so we didn't just leave it to chance. We went straight to the source. Uh, what I have done is I've reached out to the designer of the game himself. I have Cole Worley on the pod. Welcome to the show, sir. Hi, it's great to be here. All right. And also to get all of my bases covered. Uh, so <laughs> I've only played the game a couple of times. I've reached out to a friend of mine who's played it no less than 13 times. He is in the middle of a challenge to himself to play every faction four times. So this is my friend Harrison Guzman. Welcome to the show. Hey there. <laughs> so I've done the best I can, people. <laughs> if you don't know how to learn how to play this game after we do this segment, then I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Uh, cool, man. So maybe maybe tell us a little bit about yourself, Cole. Let's uh, let's get the audience acquainted with you before we uh, jet set off on this journey. Sure. So I um, I have an I guess I have a strange background. I can't I can't like do the, the the quick intro without talking about this weird background. I worked at the university and I thought I was going to like very much be a sort of member of the academy. And then right when I was about to start uh, going to a different teaching job, I got snapped up by Patrick Leader. And I whisked my family away to St. Paul, Minnesota, where I'm a staff designer at Leader Games. Mm. Uh, and Root represents basically the uh, product of a solid year's labor. I was incredibly privileged, and we had a great team. And we were all able to work pretty much full-time building this game using profits from previous Vast campaigns, basically. Mm. Uh, and then, of course, the Kickstarter funding. And, it, I mean, it was the thing that we all obsessed about for, like, literally a calendar year. <laughs> and it paid off because you now have probably the hottest game of the year so far. <laughs> Something like that. You, you, you've you been on top of the hotness. You knocked off Gloomhaven, which is a, a really, an actually impressive feat right there. Uh, all right. So um, 
I'm not going to ask Cole about design and development. There's a lot of stuff out there if you want to hear about, you know, the route kind of coming to be and, you know, some of the design choices. Uh, Heavy Cardboard has a podcast. I'm going to uh, conclude a couple of links in the show notes if you want to go hear that. For now, though, we are going to do some improve your play. We are going to do some strategy talk. We're going to help you get access to the game so that you can get started playing and playing well. So the first question I want to ask was a, I guess, a big picture question. So this game, it's an asymmetric game. Could you give us some tips about how to teach and or learn the game? Because it's a very hard teach. So if, I don't know if yeah. there's anything that you've kind of found successful or anything that you want people to know to you know before doing that. We, we gave this a lot of thought because we knew that a big reason why people um, didn't really explore VAST as much as we hoped they would. Some groups went very, very deep into VAST and were rewarded. But there were a lot of groups who were attracted by the VAST, VAST's presentation, so previous game, but they didn't grab into it. So when we went into Root, a big priority was as many entry points as possible. But you're absolutely right, Jason. Game's still really hard to teach. <laughs> I I find that there's a few basic approaches. It depends entirely on your group. So if you've got a group that does not like listening to you teach a game and you get nervous when you teach, the best thing that you can do is use the walkthrough. You've got to know the rules yourself, but yep. use the walkthrough. Um, some groups are not going to like it, but a group that doesn't mind learning while playing you can basically teach the game in kind of a Q&A format. You pass a little card around and it'll say, okay, well, I put a wood here. What's a wood? And then you can tell them, oh, these things are wood. And then when a battle happens, you can sort of see how the battle played out in the walkthrough. And then the person who knows the rules can kind of fill in the blanks. We found that that worked really well, um, sort of despite ourselves. Because here's, here's how my group learns. They want all the rules up front. Mm-hmm. They want everything. They want a long sort of Q&A following my rule spiel. Like, they want an hour. They want just a solid hour of my time. They're like the buckets, game. and you're a fire hydrant filling them with knowledge. Yeah, just fill it. And, and I'll, <laughs> I'll sometimes tell people when I, when I t- demo games, I say, okay, do you, do you want to get started? Are you, are you full? Or do you feel like you've got more room for me to continue info dumping? My own group that I tend to play with, they want all info dumps. When you do that, explain the core concepts of the game, and then go through each roll very slowly, talk about the commonalities. Uh, and then the, the, mo- the most common way, and the way we end up demoing it is kind of a hybrid approach. Um, what, what we'll do is we'll kind of very quickly say, okay, here's movement, here's fighting. Um, and then after that, we're saying, okay, now we're just going to go. And the, the person who knows the rules will kind of take, this, this is our demo, this is literally how we demo it at a booth at a convention. The person who knows the rules will explain the basic concepts. And then I'll usually say, if I'm demoing, I'm going to take your first turn. Mm-hmm. And then your second turn, I'm going to put little training wheels on the bike and I'm going to kind of give you some options. And by the third turn, you're good. And if everybody is okay having kind of a tutorial first game, I find it can really relax things. You know, so many of the games that come out, Groups cycle through them very quickly, and so there's always pressure on the first game because you don't know if you're ever going to play it again mm-hmm. or if you're going to play it maybe one more time. And what I usually tell people is like, look, Root, it's an hour game. We're probably going to play it twice, maybe even twice tonight. So like this first game, we get to put a big asterisk by it. And I think just kind of embrace the tutorialness of it. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is if people have rules questions – encourage them to try to figure out what the answer is without asking you like almost all the answers they need are on the player board and the ones that they can't find on the player board there i mean there are lots of little game aids that we've kind of hidden around and if they just hunt just a little bit they'll get it if you can figure out the secret sauce of helping a group just kind of throw away a first game as opposed to like getting all twisted like, <laughs> you didn't tell me that <laughs> Then I, I would commend you because that is the biggest barrier I have to gaming. It's like I have to know it all now. My first game has to yeah. be it. You know, uh, right. Arison, you've taught the game a bunch of times. I mean, you've you played thirteen times. So do you have anything that, <laughs> that that's occurred to you that's been successful in terms of teaching? So I mean, when when we first started out, uh, we had a lot of people get root around the same time, and one of the biggest things that I encourage people to do is even if they even if it was just them um, setting up maybe with like dolls sitting in the chairs or something, just set it up with four, four people and do the walkthrough. Cause really it, do, it does a really good job at kind of explaining each of the scenarios and how the classes work together. But um, I think I kind of like to uh, do a pretty high level overview about what each character does, but then, but then um, spend time with each person kind of drilling down what they do um, without getting too bogged down. And then once everybody starts to, uh, get an idea about 
what everybody at the table gets to do. Then I start to kind of drill into things like crafting. <laughs> yeah, and the one the one thing I'll I'll, I'll I'll sort of mention, Harrison, to supplement that is that like war gamers have this amazing secret for teaching games, uh, which is that they ask everybody to read the rules before you start playing. <laughs> Uh, it, it's yeah. crazy. Uh, I mean, I, I play at this wargaming group, and I know that like a lot of groups can't do that. But if you say, "Hey, learning to play guide," I need you to read like the first two pages, and then literally these two other pages, it will it will answer all the questions. Um, <laughs> but but of course, not every group will do that. But it's amazing. The wargamers, I always thought, like, man, I never see these guys teach. And they're like, oh no, it's like a, they have homework. That's <laughs> yeah. Like, it's funny because I'm, I'm glad you mentioned like that the war game aspect of it because this is a war game and I don't often see it kind of introduced as such, especially during a teach. So what I've seen in happen, and this is kind of a, we're leading into the strategy talk now. What I've seen happen is you get into the game and it's people kind of think about the engine building stuff. So they're starting to build the engine or whatever engine it is. Uh, and we'll get into the different engines in a second. They don't necessarily get aggressive. And the, the the war gaminess of it kind of <laughs> escapes you, and then it's usually the person, at, at least in my experience, that is the aggressor early is the person that kind of creates a lead for themselves, and then you know goes on to the win. So is that something that you know, like, what would you say about that? What would you say about like the level <laughs> of assertiveness and aggressiveness that you that a person should bring to games of root? Well, I mean, I'll say on the development side, it made it. It's very hard to balance because what we found is that like the numbers we were getting back were gibberish, but it was because there were groups who weren't used to those kind of conflict games. In terms of the aggression, I you've got to be aggressive <laughs> okay. to play it well, but the game is very, very, very emergent. And so in certain types of games, like... You can win the game without firing a shot. There are many situations where that where that can happen, as many of the factions. Like, Root doesn't fall. I think sometimes with an asymmetric game, especially like kind of a, a war game in, in, in this uh, sort of paradigm, you've you like, you got the attackers and the, and the defenders. Root doesn't really have that. Like, there are ways to play the factions defensively and ways to play them really, really aggressively. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to do the thing that's going to, like, thread the needle in the environment that's being created. Because, I mean, I'll just say this, in a game where no one is being aggressive, the Vagabond is going to win, always. Yeah. Uh, if the Vagabond's that's being played That's what I did, yeah! <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's good. It means, it means you, you played the Vagabond conf confidently, and the other player should have done something about it. <laughs> he destroyed <laughs> He actually destroyed the keep that game, and I and when he, I was watching that happen, I was like, "Oh, I I don't think I've ever seen that happen." <laughs> it was really <laughs> awkward. <laughs> yeah, the, wow. the the vagabond can get into this like turn three, turn four situation where he's just a god. Like he's mm -hmm. got so many, he he takes, he can soak so many hits. And you know, once you get to the magic like third sword, if you do get three sources of vagabond, it can be very hard to deal with you now. Even even like if if the vag the, the vagabond uh, is a bit of a glass cannon because he can he can take the game right to the precipice and then just be completely ruined if the other mm -hmm. players play well and so you have to be you have to watch him a little bit but in general that question of aggressiveness um, I think that oftentimes uh, that the the interplay between the eerie and the the cats that is the central driver of the game's environment. And in games where one of them is really aggressive and players, uh, like, I, I sort of think about aggression like the, the, the energy in the system, right? So if one player is being a, a really aggressive, everybody else kind of needs to start being aggressive. Um, and so it, 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 it sort of cycles out. And I think the game is most interesting and most dynamic at that kind of like aggression, that high level of energy. Um, it still works at the other. I think one of the reasons why it's been received really well is because people will play a very peaceable game and it will still yeah. work. But for me, the game is most interesting when you're bringing to the aggression. So, you know, to answer your question directly, like you should come with all of those sour feelings about those risk games you lost <laughs> and realize that like this is your moment to re <laughs> just for retribution, for redemption, for everything. I, I, I'll say. Some, I mean, I'll say something about kind of the. Uh, like the packaging it's in it's just like i i would set up the game and people come over and they see like the they see the woodland alliance uh to, uh wooden pieces and they say oh man that's so cute can i sit down 
<laughs> and uh, I have to kind of warn them what they're getting themselves into, especially when, um, you know, if I play as the cats and, and every turn I'm just bopping down the Woodland Alliance every time they put a sympathy down. And you're, you, you get like, hey, why are you being so mean? And, you know, once they get a little farther, then they realize you kind of have to. Um, that's I think that it's kind of interesting because it's starting to get people that wouldn't play, including myself, like such aggressive games like get get them a taste of like what kind of those games are like and i think that that's really good yeah it's it's funny because like I, I mentioned before how like a new player will focus more i tend to focus more on the constructive parts of it you know like the engine building i gotta put down this sawmill or i gotta put down you know get my third or fourth thing if you're a vagabond so I, maybe that's just our group our group is very kind of euro buildy heavy kind of thing also the vibe of the game like you know you're playing cats and you're playing mice and you're playing, <laughs> like it, it doesn't scream out okay i have to go be the aggressive person which is why it's such a shock when one person kind of at the table figures out that they have to be the aggressor and then just like boom <laughs> you know? And they're the person that ends up kind of setting the pace. So I guess that's that, that's the way to think about it. It's like the aggressive person kind of sets the pace. You can play a passive game, but if that one person is kind of being you, – you don't want to be behind that one person, so, so to speak. Yeah, I mean a lot. Like one of the things I love about war game design – and I mean I come from a background – I love old school games. And, and I think games have gotten a little less interactive over the past – Yes. five or ten years, yes. uh, which is fine because that opens other spaces of design that are also really cool and interesting. But I, there, there, I began to see this like rift where some people really wanted, uh, you know, some people were, were anxious or worried about uh, interactive design, that kind of aggressive side of gaming. And I wanted, I mean, really the whole package was designed from, from the ground up to be this approachable way to explore other parts of the hobby that you may like, you know, not, we don't have miniatures that are like coated in plastic blood or anything. Like we want it to be a little lighthearted, but then also like to have some, <laughs> to, have, to have some teeth to it. But mm -hmm. from wargaming, I, I, I really like um, the language and uh, the importance of tempo and managing sort of like, when are you on your heels? Like when are you able to kind of lunge forward? Uh, when are you wasting your turn trying to like retake your balance and when are you able to like make a play like a lot of the game and this is why i like it when it's being played aggressively like it's about that push and pull and that's stuff you can hardly not even see on the board it's the dynamic in the players mm -hmm. yeah so speaking of like um that kind of establishing that balance uh and we'll get to the different factions in a minute after i ask this last question um all of the characters can craft. So Harrison mentioned crafting yes. before. So crafting is, you know, and everybody has the same shared pool. So like everybody can craft a thing that lets you attack for free at the beginning. Like anybody can do that. So, but I also found that new, newer gamers, because I've, I've played the game and nothing but <laughs> surrounded by new players, uh, they kind of shied away from that as well. Like, or they didn't really quite have a handle on it and they just kind of like manipulate stuff on the board. Like how, how important would you say is it to kind of get your bearing around those crafting cards in order to launch yourself into the next thing? Is it like a necessary thing or do you feel like it's something that you can kind of come along a little bit later? I want Harrison to answer this question. Uh, so actually, uh, it's interesting to see mo multiple people uh, play the game multiple times because, uh, you know, you don't really know what each card does or, or uh, the passive effects. Sometimes people um, even read them wrong, um, like, trying to use them kind of as as uh, reactionary things other I guess other than ambush but um, like it's interesting to this like when people discover oh wait like I have no cards every round and this card if I put it down is gonna give me a card every turn um, and it's interesting to see like how people um, start to start to kind of value that or even I've seen people, specifically not move into I mean move into like woodland territory because they might lose a, a card they're holding on to um or even or even if you even start to notice when people like very clearly are are trying to build three of a kind so that they can just use a favor of card it's mm -hmm. those are those are those are all kind of like funny things that happen once you kind of get familiar with with what the crafting cards are or even or even um it's kind of funny when you play with a vagabond that is clearly on a war path and and uh you have people saying well i'm gonna build him a sword <laughs> <laughs> that benefits <Right>. me right <laughs> 
<laughs> no one broke yeah. his sword, by the way. I won that whole game with one sword. Where's that magical third sword? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so with, with crafting, um, okay, so it's it's a thing. Here's how I tend to approach it. Certain factions are a lot better at it than others. Birds, oh, yeah. it's bad. It's hard, like, <laughs> especially... I mean, there are different situations where it can work, but like you just need your cards so so bad. Um, with the cats, if you have a, a recruit heavy strategy, you can pivot to workshops and you can craft a little bit. But the key thing with crafting that I'll tell people, especially as as if I'm taking a group that's played it, the game a few times, is like you can't craft everything, and especially like the better crafting cards, which are the ones that are higher in suit count. Um, those are better, uh, but they really mean that you can't craft everything. Mm -hmm. So the way you put your crafting structures and like, so, that, so for me, crafting is there, there, there are two sort of things to keep in mind. One of them is absolutely small scale. Like, Oh, should I just score this extra victory point? If I craft a crossbow or something, or like, oh, this is a cute little thing, and I have the chance to do it. And the other thing is a tremendously like bird's eye view of the entire game. Like as the eerie, am I going to try to secure the fox clearings because I know that's going to give me access to something like brutal tactics or like the high the high crafting fox cards? Mm -hmm. Like that that can be. I mean, you make those decisions at the very beginning of the game. And they're kind of like pushing your entire strategy a little bit. And I mean, I've had games where my initial draw of those three cards goes a long way in determining kind of the shape of my general course. And yeah. now, you know, it, it's it, then it really hurts if the raccoon walks up to you and steals one of your cards. That you <laughs> but but and, and there are certain cards that trigger that, and it depends on the faction, right? So like the favor cards are unbelievably good. Yeah. Um, but you can really hurt yourself trying to pull them off. Uh, for the Woodland Alliance, like they're they're a lot easier to, to manage, and you can even manage them quite early in the game, which can be really really scary. Um, so the, these are the the bomb cards that clear all the pieces out of clearings from the same mm -hmm. color. And the last thing I'll mention too is, and, and this is something that uh, players will miss occasionally, um, the setup order is really important. And the board can be played from any corner. It was funny. I ran to a group, and I, I mentioned that, and they are like, oh, I thought the keep always had to go here. I'm like, no. Like, when, when, the, when the cat sets up, the cat picks which corner they're going to start from. The board has really different geometry at any corner, and where you put your keep matters a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it isn't just an issue of the cards you happen to have in your hand, because, and this is the reason why the crafting costs are decoupled from the suits and the cards. Like, the bunny cards are going to be about extra actions, extra cards, extra stuff. And so if you want like a higher economic volume, you want to start your keep so that you can get your, your workshops and bunny clearings. Mm. Wow. <laughs> That's the kind of thing I wanted to know. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah. So let, let's get into it. So we, you're talking about the cats. Let's talk. Let's get into each of the different <laughs> factions. Um, so let's start with the cats because they because they they rule the land, right? They are yeah, the, the yeah. ones that they, you you walk all across a game of root. You're going to see a bunch of orange cats all over the board. Uh, so they start off all over the place, and so they have like different approaches. Like you can go for like a builder strat. You know, get lots of resources, lots of sawmills, and all that kind of stuff. You have like you know six six wood or however much wood you know and, and like a couple of turns and you can just do build whatever you want or and or you can go like the aggressive end of things which is you know all you know heavy recruitment and you know like get a bunch of dudes on the board go from there um mm -hmm. so you can do that but then there's like you know just kind of a balanced type strat so like you know, just kind of like go down the row it's like i'm gonna build these three <laughs> all three and then all three and then all three like is there um like, like guys I just tell me your general thoughts on like you know the different approaches and if you have any advice for people who are trying to get their minds around the cats so the cats are usually the role you give to the player who's the most scared of the game <laughs> because because they're simple they have the small i think the the rules for the cats are something like 300 words or something or 200 even um, they, and in fact, like the Vagabond has the most complicated rules and the cat has the least. And so when I was working on the expansion races, uh, I knew I had to keep the word count in between those two poles. So usually you give the cats to like the players a little sheepish. I think the cats are really hard. I think they might be like, 
The lizards are definitely the weakest faction, and we have talked about <laughs> expansions. Um, I have opinions about that, but uh, the the cats are wicked, wicked, wicked hard. Uh, my general advice for the cats are: uh, you're going to be tempted constantly. Like you're you're the forest policeman, and you're going to be uh, tempted constantly to stop, like taking keeping control. Where you're like, oh, you know, I could just, I don't need to recruit this turn. I kind of want to overwork and get some more wood. Like once you lose control, you'll never get it back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the the second half of the game will become just like a story about how you are like stumbling through, like trying to put enough wood out to because basically your wood is converting to victory points at about one point of wood with some like little exceptions you could take advantage of but for me it, the question is about control like mm-hmm. how much are you going to put on your front how much are you going to devote to dealing with the alliance in the three player game the dynamic is a little different but uh it's the same basic question um and once you know once the birds punch through or if a revolt happens in the wrong spot and you lose like six warriors you're going to have a really hard time uh, sort of getting out of that situation. So, and and mostly it's about containment and really really smart builds. Um, so, like one and one more thing about the way th- the cats work. If you feel like the cats are dominating your games, it's because not, when you're attacking buildings, when people are attacking the cats, not all their buildings are created equally. Uh, the sawmills are really the only ones that are worth killing. Mm. Uh, and once other players start targeting them the game will start getting weirder. So this is a funny, and this is a general comment I want to make about like getting good at root, which is that um, often with newer players, the game will end in eight or nine turns. With experienced players, you'll get up to 11 or 12 turns. And those last turns are weird, and the board is empty. <laughs> and it's and it has a different it has a different character. I really like the end game, and it 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 takes groups a while to actually get to the. It's funny. I mean, I've I've known groups who who've played this game. Uh, you know, as much as you have Harrison, uh, and they've actually never like gotten to the end game. And the end game is like, oh, this is like a wasteland. Like everything is ruined. <laughs> We're all like at twenty four points, and none of us can score anything. Yeah. I mean, I have taken a dominance at twenty four points hmm. because there was um, no way I was going to be able to get to the end outside of like pushing my little otters to the right corners and sort of nailing it. But as the cats in general, like I think. Try not to think about those three building types as different strategic paths. The main question is control. So, like, the recruiters are going to give you more control, and the sawmills are going to give you less. And kind of everything you do is between those poles. Mm. Okay. So then, I guess, yeah. focus. try to focus on recruiters as much as possible, and then the sawmills think, are kind of like a supplement to, you know, buttress all that. Yep, yep. I think mean, that, that is a good opening policy. And then as you get better, you can be like, I don't need that extra recruiter. I can manage it. Right. Um, and, in, yeah, go ahead. Harris. In my experience, it's kind of like I've seen a bunch of people kind of re- I mean, think that it's going to be, oh, it's going to be pretty easy to build up all this wood and build up all these buildings, especially later in the game. But then you'll see that people start to realize that like building starts to peter out as buildings start to get more expensive. Or even um, I've seen people uh like kind of hold on to sawmills and then they just generate i mean they just can kind of keep them there because they generate a point for someone that just attacks them every turn or like the wood it generates every turn but um i i kind of like almost always try to like go for a dominant dominance card as quickly as possible and then just like keep really quiet about like building recruits around them um mm-hmm. i don't know do you think that the cats are more generally more or less uh, targeted towards uh, dominance or or even just point point victories. Have you seen both? Uh, uh, we it's as close to an even keel as you could get. Um, they, yeah, they win sometimes with the dominances and sometimes by points. The 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 cat dominances are tricky because usually when you activate them, you have more points than anybody else, and that is a funny thing because the dominances were originally designed so that they could help players who were losing still like have a role in the game but that that actually isn't uh and it it was better the the game is better for it that isn't really what what happens what happens is that the cats get a hold and they think okay i've got this long path where i need to get 15 more points or i can just sit on the two corner clearings and just live there and uh you it's a tricky thing i think that um 
you, it depends on how ba- how much damage you've been able to do to the birds. So like if you can really get the birds down, the and, and if the vagabond's like out of position, you can sneak the dominances sometime. Um, but here's here's the thing about, about the dominance cards. Um, once you get the handle of the game, it is super obvious when a player is holding on to one of them. <laughs> so like, why, why are you sending all of your guys to the far corners? That doesn't make any sense. And it's like, and literally with a turn warning, you can you can get in there and stop it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because the dominance cards definitely screamed, okay, catch up mechanisms. Like, oh, okay, you're 15 points ahead of me. I I have to go for this thing now. But it evolved into something different. So could you, um, we'll get to the different factions in a second, but could you tell it, break down like which factions are kind of more leaning towards those dominance victories and which ones are less? Sure. Uh, so the cats are in the middle. Um, the expansion race, the otters, is really good at them. Because they can recruit along the river. And mm-hmm. so that, that, that gives them these like drops, especially in the late game. You, you see dominance cards. Uh, it depends on what the corner is playing. I see the birds win with them a fair amount. Uh, the alliance doesn't really have a hope, although I've seen it. I've actually I've seen every race win with them. But the, yeah, but, but the alliance, I think, is the longest shard. The lizards also, it was funny when people were uh, grousing about the, the lizards. Um, some folks suggested, oh, well, they're actually better at uh at dominance wins i thought that's crazy um because and and if you are shooting for a dominance win the main thing i would mention is to don't be afraid to tactically retreat like you don't have to lose your entire army like Mm -hmm. it's more important that you keep unit density for the late game because you're going to really wish that you had even like three people on the board or four (laughs) um and so uh, I, yeah, I find that like cats, birds um, are probably the strong, and the otters are the strongest contenders. The other ones you don't see it as much. Mm. So let's get to them birds. So uh, the Erie Dynasty, it's one of those. Um, if you have a combo lover at the table and you have people that can plan three, four, five, six moves ahead, that's the faction for them. So I mean, I don't. That's that's not me. <laughs> so <laughs> if I don't even have a question, just kind of uh, give us some thoughts on the Erie and you know what people should look out for, and maybe more importantly, what traps people fall into when they play the birds. Sure. So I'll give I'll give you the 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 for easy trap, and it's a trap that we like built a little bit by design. Um, so in the tutorial, we give people the death spot because it gets them going and gives them like some pressure. Um, but the, I think the death spot is an awful starting. Uh, what is it? The death spot? <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the death spot starts with a vizier on move and build. Mm. So it means that when you start your turn, you're going to be kind of expanding and growing and growing. And that's very fun. But then very quickly you get yourself into like kind of unsustainable situations. Um, my own preference is to start with the charismatic who recruits twice as well and i just dump all my pieces on the board right away Mm -hmm. um i so with with the eerie my my general advice is it's okay to collapse so long Mm -hmm. as you are planning to collapse Mm -hmm. uh and so i like when i play the eerie i like to almost always play two cards especially if i don't have bird cards in my hand i will fill up i'll get the biggest decree i could possibly get and i will i will engineer my own collapse and lose a couple points, and it's not a big deal, because now I own a big chunk of the board and have tons of pieces on the board. Hmm. Um, and so I, I like to play like a two or a three collapse game. Um, there are people in the office who swear by like a very careful, I am not going to collapse even once strategy. So don't, don't fear collapses, just plan for them, is my general advice about the Erie. You were mentioning that in your notes, Harrison, that you like you you don't mind collapsing, but you plan for them. Yeah, so that's that's like my first line plan around them as a like a fact of life. Because uh, I've played with people that are just so careful, like that that they know that they're not going to be able to get uh, to to you know get a battle in in a bunny clearing or something, so they they won't put it down, and then they end up having really tiny decrees, and uh, by the time they get started, or even just fail because because they were so careful then like everybody else is uh just starting to bulldoze over them and especially since you know they they actually can lose points uh like people get discouraged pretty pretty easily i think but i mean if you plan correctly you could you could still end your turn generating positive points <laughs> yeah and, and, well and and just to to add on to that like the eerie's action economy is so ludicrous 
I mean, it, it, <laughs> yeah. is, it, it is up there like it is there. So if you were to like think about the action economy of each role, um, the Vagabond is very high, very high up there. It starts slow and it's, it's very fragile, but the Vagabond is up there. You can take lots of actions per turn. The Eerie oh, yeah. can take more. Uh, but you can't get there if you're only playing one card per turn. Mm-hmm. Um, so you really have to like throw yourself at it. Uh, and this is why, like, again, it's the small stuff about the setup because you get to look at your hand before you pick your leader. And if you have like a handful of bird cards, then you probably want to plan for like a zero to one collapse game. If you don't have any bird cards, grab the charismatic leader or like the builder because the theory, the theory actually do have a pretty interesting crafting strategy. I mean, one of, so like my, my preferable build is to like I like starting with the charismatic and then pivoting to the builder and I won't even touch the the commander or the despot in some games. I mean there's there's a lot of different ways that they can work. But the the main one is you are really rewarded for planning. And uh that in terms of their vulnerability uh from other factions, be aware that if you put a colored card, a suited card in recruit and you only have one roost of that type, you're mm-hmm. gonna get ruined. Because if they can cause you to collapse on the recruit phase of your turn, you don't get the rest of your turn. Mm. So like you almost always, when you do collapse, you want to collapse at battle or at build some part at the very end of your turn. So you at least get, you don't, you don't lose a full turn. Mm-hmm. I think one of the biggest things for birds, because I think that uh, people don't you take advantage of the, uh, the fact that they, they, uh, they rule pretty easily, you know, uh, more than other people. Cause uh, they win ties. Um, a lot of people kind of build to build that they have to, they have to, you know, uh, be the only piece left in the clearing that they build a roost in. And yes. sometimes that, that puts you in so much danger, especially, especially if like, you know, somebody has an ambush card and you end up not being able to build in the first place when you could have just, just hung out with right. the, the cat. Okay. So, um, the Woodland Alliance is, I guess, oh my God. <laughs> They're, they're they're so slow, like, and that's why it's a, a, maybe a frustrating thing for a new player to do. It's like, okay, uh, like by the time turn three or four hits, you haven't really made that much of a dent on the board. So I mm-hmm. could see, you know, people kind of saying, "Oh no, you know, it's not, you know, uh, you know, give them the cats the first and all that kind of stuff." Uh, sure. see, and you were saying before how like the, the, it's the cats and the birds that kind of set the pace, and the woodland lines has to kind of find their way in that. So I guess do you have – it's also um, – tell, tell me if I'm wrong. Like It's kind of the most mental of the original factions where you have to yeah. kind of guess and play the factions off in like, you know, a sense where the battles are going to happen and then kind of you know plan your strategy around that. Is that kind of the mindset that you intended when you uh, oh, designed the alliance? Definitely. And I mean yeah. all, all, of the, all of the factions have these funny little puzzles. And for the Woodland Alliance – um, one of the hardest decisions you have to make the entire game is where you put your first sympathy because it, it matters so much. And it, it depends on, I mean, there, so when I teach the game, if I'm demoing and we're short a player, I will always play the Woodland Alliance, even though they do not have, like, if you're just measuring the word count of the rules, it's not bad. It's just that there are, you kind of have to know every little part of them in order to get them to work. Um, so, my 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 general advice for playing them is you want to revolt as soon as you possibly can. And I say this both because it's going to mix up the game and make your game... It's going to get you to that aggressive place uh, where the game is, really fires, but also because it will allow you to better understand when you should revolt and when you shouldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like, like when I run demos... We, we stack the deck a little bit, but in the vat, I mean, in a huge, there's a huge number of possible hands the Woodland Alliance can get where they can revolt on the, on the second turn. They almost always can. Um, and so I will usually say, like, you are absolutely planning to re- revolt on the second turn. And then as soon as you revolt, that very first officer you get, if you can't get a second officer, use that action to recruit. Because once you get two guys on the board, nobody really wants to deal with you anymore. Because you get that <laughs> combat advantage, and having two guys, it seems like a small amount, but it, it re- it's really discouraging. Having three guys is terrifying. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> the, the, the numbers on it are really funny when we were running models to see like how scary is a big army because of how the combat works. So basically, the Woodland Alliance, there's an advantage in the game that's built for the attacker. The Woodland Alliance always gets it even when they're defending. 
Uh, but the disadvantage is that it's hard. It's really hard for them to get to get troops. Um, what I so I guess the way that I think Woodland Alliance strategy. It's funny because um, I think people think that they are probably the strongest faction at the moment. Them or the Vagabond, um, because they can get very very bursty, and mm-hmm. it's really easy when you think you're killing the Woodland Alliance that you're actually just making their life much easier. Uh, and so you want to avoid that. Uh, and so before talking about Woodland Alliance strategy, I should talk a little bit about how to deal with them. And the way you yeah. deal with them is containment. Mm-hmm. Like, you, you, don't, you don't snuff them out. You let them sit on the board in one or two clearings, and you surround those clearings. And you make it hard for them to extend. Um, and, you know, police them in places where you don't want revolts to happen. But don't get overzealous. Don't go marching your army on some crusade. Because you're, you're just going to feed their engine. So, you know, generally, like, people who overreact to the alliance end up making them worse. Uh, now, when it comes to Woodland Alliance strategy, your goal is to give your enemies very, very, very hard decisions. And so don't overspread your sympathy because the threat of a revolt is as scary as a real revolt. And ask mm-hmm. them to like pick between their children. Like, oh, do you want to lose that clearing, or do you want to lose this clearing? I know yeah. you've only got actions for one. Um, <laughs> and so, like, if you can pre- force those hard choices, they really come together. And then a lot of their weakness in the early game is offset by the fact that they are crafting uh, masters. They are such good crafters. They can craft mm. pretty much anything they ever want to craft. Yeah, okay. I mean, there's the. I've played a few games where like. I don't think there's anything more terrifying than a Woodland Alliance that has two bases built and then a bunch of sympathy like for the thing that's not being built because then you're just walking on eggshells like wondering when they're going to do it because right um, <laughs> and uh, they play a lot of mind games. Mm-hmm. This is a question from uh, Brady Sadler uh, who loved the game by the way. But why do the Woodland Alliance suck so bad against the robot cats? Oh, oh it, <laughs> they they just can't do it. I mean, like the, the, the robot cats, it's a funny thing, the way the bot works, um, because we built it and then we were going to build another version, but we found it was very fun or it was it, it was tickling us at least. Um, but it, it's a it's a funny co-op game, especially because uh, so it doesn't do certain things like if you were playing the Alliance, it is. I have we I think our record was like maybe 15 points and we were pushing it real hard and we just couldn't like mm. the alliance is very geographically constrained and that is that is just no good in dealing with the cats and they all, also the alliance needs the game to slow down and the robot cats will never slow down the game. I will say that even as the alliance is bad um the co-op game is really fun with the alliance as a partner because you have to game it and you have to do these marches through the alliance territory to give them cards to build them up and it's a, it's an interesting puzzle like the the alliance eerie win that we got in the office it took us about it took us a few days to figure out how to do it and then i think we got to game 3 like we survived 3 games against the raw cats with our alliance eerie combo but we were really having to push the system hard. So the reason that they suck is because the robot cat is it's, it's a nightmare. I mean, it like it it's the cat player, but without any of the usual cat weaknesses. Right. Uh, yeah. I we, yeah. We all kind of knew that. We were kind of joking back and forth. Like the, like this uh, this faction is just not meant to solo the robot cats. It's just really funny. <laughs> it was a favorite faction, and you can't play it solo. So not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're getting definitely pretty long, so I'm gonna try to push this along. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, Vagabond. So this is my personal favorite faction. It's my personal favorite play <laughs> style because I don't have to look at the entire board. I can just kind of like stick and move and, you know, uh, you know, d- duck and dive and all that kind of stuff. It's really fun. Um, the, the thing that I kind of struggled with in the early game though is so you're, you're, you kind of depend on some level on players crafting items so that you can kind of go and trade for them. So I was wondering, like, do I have to be like chatty? <laughs> No, like, you don't talk you don't to people to up, and it's like, okay, <laughs> it's like, it's, hey, I'll do this and I'll do this. Is that something I need to do? Because I felt kind of pressured to do that. No, like that's what the otters are for. Yeah, uh, oh. our our graphic design uh, designer Nick 
uh, will often like uh, equate the otters to being like kind of a shady used car salesman. Uh, but like they, they're still selling the cars. The, the, the vagabond doesn't have to be that chatty. Like I, he can be. Um, really, the other players should be chatty at you hmm. because when you're handing out cards, getting those easy victory points in the early game, if there's an alliance player in the game, I want every single one of those cards or you should just be my friend. Um, mm-hmm. And that's likewise true for the birds. So like, and th- this is the reason why like, I think the cats will have the hardest time winning over the Vagabond just because the other factions just want them so bad. They're just besieging <laughs> constantly. Um, mm-hmm. I, so again, like my, my feeling of the Vagabond is uh, it is most lucrative to have an enemy, um, but you, you have to choose who you're going to expose yourself to. Very, very rarely is it the cat. The cat by far has the most points on the table. So if, if, you're, if you're the enemy of the cat and you can hold your own, you are going to win the game. You're going to make a mint. But mm-hmm. the cost to your movement, and if, if the cat realizes what you're doing, they can shut you down, um, it's, it can be really disastrous. So usually I'll tell players, like, try not to kill anybody until, like, the mid-game. Because if you go hostile turn one, you're in trouble. I think that Jason uh, deserves an honorable mention for the last game that I saw for him <laughs> when he was playing with the cats, and he he actually had the best relationship with them, but uh, he was able to sne- sneak into the keep, and he was just destroying everything. The, the sawmill was generating wood, and uh, he was he was earning points from them, getting the unprotected bonuses. <laughs> yeah, he, he left <laughs> and, the keep uh, undefended, like there were no people there, so I didn't have I didn't get the penalty for de- defeating the units i just defeated the buildings and I, that just got me points and nothing and i was nice about it i said i apologized <laughs> and we had kept the for the actual above the table friendship together so. <laughs> it was just funny it was funny because because like kind of thematically it was like who did that who destroyed yeah, yeah. The, the-, the arson <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah there, okay. i mean i i think that like that is the ludicrous way to make points um Aid is actually, like, if you can get to the ally status, it's great. But the ally status, you can very rarely take advantage of it because as soon as you start pulling in those high points, your ally is going to attack you and you're going to accidentally kill one of those guys. Um, I will sometimes see the ally status happen in coalition games and uh, in games that get to that late game where you really actually do need somebody to help you lead around your armies. And so you kind of put up with the Vagabond a little bit. This is especially true of the Tinker, who will sometimes go into the late game without any swords. And do and do just fine, because he can he can use the armies of other players. Right. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I, yeah, get. Um, so, actually, uh, I mean, I think what people first start to do whenever they see the Vagabond is just kind of, like, beeline for the ruins. Do you, is that kind of like a default? first step or is there a way to kind of get your actions going without kind of building those up because you are opening spots for people to build too yeah i i I try to not use the ruins that much the ruins are the ruins are there for for games where you don't like nobody's sitting on any cards or i'm sorry no one has crafted anything um and also like you know you can get it later so what i'll what i'll tend to do is if if there's one or two items on offer a sure item is better than a random draw because of the ruins, the hammer is probably the best thing or the sword is maybe next. Mm -hmm. The bags situational, the boot is not great. Uh, And so like rather than roll the dice on the ruin, if someone's offering a a sword or a hammer or I mean, a coin coin would be almost impossible in the first turn, but I've seen it happen. Um, Like I'm going to go that way. Um, the, the, I'll, usually by the end of the game, I will have cleaned up like two of, of the four ruins or sometimes three. Rarely do I bother to go through all of them. Um, because the cat needs the space really oh, bad. Yeah. And also the lizards need the space really badly. And sometimes it's better just to, just to not touch them. Um, depends on who you are. Like if you're playing the, the tinker, you can go through the game and not even touch a ruin and be just fine because you've got the ability to craft a lot of those basic items by yourself. First of all, thank you very, very much. This was really helpful. For somebody who's just getting into the game, I actually have a lot of the kind of knowledge about, you know, the next time I'll play, just what to look for and everything. So that's been really cool. So um, is there anything, any uh, kind of last, uh, 
any, any last bits of advice, general advice? We've covered a lot, but if there's like kind of some take homes that you would suggest, you know, you can kind of offer them now. Yeah, I would say uh, pay attention to the other players who are playing. Pay attention to the board. Um, it this is not a game about finding secret conversion points or building efficient engines. Uh, the engine creation of the game is very simple because it's not important. Uh, it depends a lot more on what the other players at the table are doing. So, so pay attention to them and enjoy the company of the people who've gathered around the game because that's where the game's going to be decided. And Harrison, you've played 13 times. <laughs> 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 Anything emerge from your 13 plays you'd like to kind of get out there? Um, I mean, I guess I can't really suggest that people try to play it as much as I have because, I mean, I love the game, but I think that there it hasn't been a game where I haven't discovered, oh, whoa, that's how those two work together. Or, like, even just discovering that, like, you know, a two-player game uh, versus the same two-player game plus plus the cats or something is an entirely different game. Like, I think that it's so interesting to see how the different combinations of games, like, encourage different things and just kind of knowing that there's not such a thing as, like, a... Like a like a solid strategy for one one faction. Um, just explore the game. That's why I, that's why I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. All right. So we have not talked about solo very much. We have not talked about co-op very much. We haven't really brushed in the expansion except for the odd comment here and there. So much more to talk about. So much more to discover. Uh, maybe as Rook continues to dominate the charts, we'll have Cole back and he'll <laughs> uh, round it out. Uh, actually, is there is there more content coming for Root? Uh, so, more factions, more stuff. Th- there's nothing to announce. But there are uh, – so we have lots of other factions in studio that we're always oh. fooling around with. And Ooh. we don't know – like, here's the thing. Our production <laughs> schedule is completely full. We, we are busy for, like, the next while, and we have nothing nothing planned. Patrick Killen, if you even mentioned that thing. But, but there is a little community on BGG, and I think there are now, like, eight or even ten fan races – in various states of development. So I think it's likely that within a few months, we're going to see just bundles of user-generated content for people who want to explore the, explore the system. I mean, the system is built to be as capacious as possible. So like, there's a lot of room for everybody to play. And I've been so cheered by like logging on and seeing like, ah, these are the mole people, or this is like a new solo system or whatever. Uh, I think it's great. And you're going to give an imprimatur on a couple of those to l- let us know what, what's good to play? Of course. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Cole. This was bit, this has been really great. Yeah, my pleasure. And thank you, Harrison, for giving us the time. Uh, thank you for filling in my knowledge gap because <laughs> I'm clearly terrible at this game. I'm like you. We'll get you there. All right. This episode is long. <laughs> we went on a long time with Cole. We hope that was... Uh, to your satisfaction, I'm listening to it, trying to edit it down. I'm like, nope, don't want to cut that. that nope, that's good stuff. So, sorry for a little bit of a longer one, but we hope it is worth it. The game is certainly worth it. Uh, like we said before the jump, uh, this is one of our favorite games of the year. Uh, so, yeah, there you go. Uh, that is all about a 360-degree view of Root. Yes. All right, guys, that is everything for this week. Brant, thank you again for coming on. Two weeks in a row, you're pro, man. Root. Baby root, baby root, a root, a root. Hey, what is that? What's Thank happening? you. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to come on. And uh, Anthony, let's get some more heavy euros to the table and uh, get an episode going again here. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. I know we're going to be, uh, we'll see each other in uh, Philadelphia here in a couple months. So we'll have to get yeah, something to the table. Great. Definitely. All right, guys. So that is everything. This has been Root All Root, Root All Week. So you're probably listening to this all week. Uh, <laughs> make sure you hop on all the places we hang out and have a conversation about Root or, hey, another game, if, if you're feeling up to it. Um, we're on Facebook. You can check out the Every Night is Game Night group. You can check us out on Twitter at ENGN underscore podcast or in all the different places solo gamers hang out. But that is everything for this week. So until next time, grab a solo game off the shelf and let's make every night game night. Later, everybody. Ciao. Oh, you should have killed me, but you know what will happen if you do. Or yeah, yeah, they um. So 
they're uh, they are not great. I love them. <laughs> And this is oh, the lizard yeah. you're talking about, right? These are the lizards. They're, they, it's like the, they come into the game a little lame, and they, they can easily like break their other leg. But <laughs> I, they, are, they're, they are my favorite race to play because nice. they're hard. They're so hard. And when you, when you get that win, when you pull it off, you feel like such a maniacal genius. <laughs> it's a, because I, so like I, I used to play a lot of diplomacy in tournaments and whatnot, and I love Italy, and Italy is n- the hardest. They're the hardest. Like, there, there's nothing easy about that position. Um, and I wanted to make the lizards really, really hard. And so, like, late in development, I made them even harder. Uh, <laughs> and I don't, and I, don't, I don't regret it, although it's the kind of thing that, like, there's been a lot of interest in tournament rules. I could see boosting the lizards a little bit to make them like to give them tournament parity. There's yeah. a couple of really easy things that you can do uh, to like, oh, you know, I don't lose a card when I lose a garden. Like that, that boost will pretty much put them at parity. Oh yeah. But my trick for them is uh, one, they do a lot better in games with the otters, mm-hmm. a lot, a lot, lot better because they can spend money like they're crazy. And so you know. Um, Things like uh, the mercenaries, which is a, a rare, like nobody buys mercenaries from the otters usually. The lizards love the mercenaries because it lets them build gardens everywhere. Um, and, and they've got a big pile of unbuilt warriors so they can use to build them. So put the otters in the game with it, or the vagabond. And the other thing is don't spend your acolytes unless they're hated. Yeah. Uh, because that, like, well, people will, will spend them inefficiently, and you may only get them hated once in the game or twice. Mm-hmm. And so like, and usually you have to engineer it and it's, it's not easy, especially in games when you're sitting downwind in the lines play or something. Um, but uh, if you can make it in the best interest of the other players to like, my favorite thing about the lizards is you can play the game in such a way that one player starts running away. And then right when everyone's like, Oh no, <laughs> the eerie's got it. You can approach them and say like, or, if you get, yeah. if you if you join me for just a second, I'll make sure that he loses, and then you know they like they hand they hand their free will over to you, and that, that <laughs> yeah that 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 that's kind of the, the yeah. part it's open to get for him. But yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. glad you, I'm glad you've been noticing. I mean, I'll tell you the the one thing that has been really lovely about watching the reception of this game is like we were playing it like like crazy people for months, and then to go to be at Gen Con and to see so many games. And people come up, coming up to me like day three of the con being like, I've played this game six times. And all my <laughs> plays were at the con. And I've got these questions. And I was like, six times? You're a Gen Con. You can play anything you want. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but there is something about the design that, uh, that just asks people, that just pulls people in, that makes them want to play a second game. And I think that, I mean, it's a testament to the studio. Everybody did a really good job on it. I think, yeah. you know, so Vast made such a huge impact, right? I mean, it's an asymmetrical game. I can't believe – it was more like – um, I think of it like 504 from Friedman Freeze. It's like this kind of design achievement, <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's like, wow, I can't believe they did that in a game. And then you got it to the table, and it was hard to kind of get into, you know? It was, it was it felt like more of an achievement than a, like a game. Like not to say yes. that Vast is a bad game. Like Vast is a good game. I like, I like Vast. But like I can't, I don't, I don't want to like play a bunch. I I didn't play the warrior and say, oh, I have to get into the goblins or whatever. The goblins looked a little bit more complicated. Looked like I didn't want to play that style of for whatever reason. Like the different factions didn't really speak to each other, and the mechanics didn't say, okay, let me try this, let me try this. Vast, uh, I'm sorry, uh, root like. The because of the vagabond, because like okay, all of a sudden this this guy's like horning it on me and wanting my stuff, and because the you know the 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 cats are start start a lot and they draw back and the, the eagle spread like everything interacts so much like you were talking about before the the inter, the the emphasis on interaction is something that we haven't gotten in a lot of games, especially a lot of like the AAA games like Terraform Mars, not a lot of interaction. Uh, sure. side, you know, side a little bit. I mean, not you could kind of go most of the game with only paying attention to your own spot. Root, no, yeah. like it manages to do <laughs> a lot of the modern game stuff with that level of interaction. And like, it, I don't know, it just has this secret sauce about it. That's like, wow, I didn't know I wanted this game until now I'm playing it. You know? Yeah, and I like this is this is why like now that we're out there, like I um like I want us to keep supporting it because there's there's a ton of other stuff we can do with the with the engine. Yeah. 
So I guess you know if you want to, like I, mean, I can just pin this towards like you know towards the end, like maybe break down quickly the like the otters and some of the other expansion factions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can I, I can break it down. I mean, well, I, okay. So let me think. Yeah, okay. So um, quick, this is quick strategy guide for the expansion factions. Yeah. Um, best played when they're together. So you definitely, I think. One of my favorite pairings in the game is birds, cats, lizards, otters. It's it's wild and it's highly mm-hmm. recommended. Um, the otters are the their goal. I mean, I, the way I tend to think about them is, you know, you're going to build a bunch of trade posts, and that's going to be your point engine, but it's not going to get you to the finish line. So the time that you spend crafting or with a few dividends um, can really take you there. The otters are. They're a race that will, will trick you into thinking that you can win by doing what you're doing because you're generating points. But then you get right to the finish line and you realize, oh, mm-hmm. all of my trading posts that got destroyed, they didn't come back to my tracks. They're gone. And now I, I just am, I'm 12 points short of, of this final score. And how you get those 12 points, it's crafting and it's dividends. And so sneaking those in on the early side can mean a lot later. Mm-hmm. Other thing about the otters is they are great, great, great at fighting. Uh, fighting yeah. is cheap for them. They are good at getting their warriors on the board. They're great at dominance checks. Um, it's funny. Then, yeah, go ahead. It's Anderson. funny too. It's funny too because their hand is visible. So, so like, if you have a bunch of ambushes, you you could like drive up the price and say, you know, it'd be a shame if I'd have to use this ambush. Or <laughs> yeah, and then like people are having to buy them. I mean, I think what ends up happening with the otters is that the, the first game somebody will like just buy everything from them and then that player will, will just completely win the game and then everybody else will follow suit for the second game and then the otters will win and so mm-hmm. you, you want to be like a little hesitant to buying for the lizards uh go into the game knowing you're weak and knowing that you are only going to win on a turn 10 11 12 like very late game victory mm-hmm. uh and play accordingly so you want to frustrate players you want to put yourself in positions where you may be useful to them uh, you want to be best, best friends with the Otters and best friends with the Vagabond. Um, mm. The Vagabond and, and Vagabond players should feel comfortable giving you cards because, you know, you're, you are the weakest player. If you inhabit their weakness a little bit, um, you can uh, you can create some really interesting dynamics in the second half of the game. <laughs> so we got the, um, the Otters, we got the Lizards. Who else is out there? Uh, well, there's another Vagabond, right? I'm interested. To, oh, yeah, the double Vagabond's crazy. Um, I'm trying to hear. I've never played that combination, but I was kind of interested in hearing, like, how that kind of plays out. Where It's it's the and, – and the way to play the double Vagabond is to probably cat birds two Vagabonds. And your biggest enemy is the other Vagabond. You mm-hmm. will sometimes, like, mentally trick yourself into thinking, like, oh, I'm on the same team as this guy. Yeah, <laughs> um, you are not. And in fact, he is the one or she is the one who you're going to have the hardest time stopping. So it, when you get any chance, you just go, you go into him and you don't really get penalized for it. Um, and so I really like two Vagabonds are interesting because they will usually always be fighting and running away from each other. Because if one of them breaks away, the other Vagabond probably won't be able to, to rein him in because they'll be on other sides. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I love the dagger, double Vagabond game. I think it's hilarious. Uh, could I ask a question about one of the Vagabond classes? Like, uh, yeah. the I think it's like the Scoundrel or something that just yes. drops a drops a flame and something. And is that the yeah. Scorched Earth one? Yeah, and it's gone forever. Yeah, just <laughs> it, uh, so basically, the Scoundrel has this ability where a Scoundrel can take his torch, and you only get one torch in the whole game, and can put it in a clearing, and it kills everything in the clearing. And then no one can enter that clearing. So once the scoundrel leaves that clearing, it's it's empty. It's stuck empty. And, and the torch will just sit there on the clearing. Um, the threat of the torch, it's just like a favor card. <laughs> and since the threat of the torch is often more powerful than the torch. I have seen the middle fox clearing with five connections destroyed. Oh and it, it just wrecks the <laughs> geometry of the board. But it's, it's one, I mean... It, uh, one of the last playtest games we ever played, which is probably my favorite game I've ever played of Root, was Otters, Cats, the Scoundrel Vagabond, and the Lizards. And it was won on, like, turn 14 by the Lizards, maybe even turn 15, but the board was empty. 
I mean, there were like three or four pieces like waddling around it. Uh, and the, the Vagabond, I mean, it was amazing because uh, the Otters kept going for a dominance victory and then the scoundrel would dart over there and then the Otters would, would, would run away. <laughs> or, <laughs> and so like, yeah. where, where that final torch is getting placed is like the central drama of the game. Um, you know, there is, there is a goofiness. Like, I, I think that the, the game is rightly thought to be like somewhat heavy and it's, you know, it, it isn't, it isn't, uh, it's not, I, I think it, it, there's a little bit of complexity to it. What would but you say? Like, I mean, cause in terms of like the light middle heavy spectrum that people use, what would you say this fits? This is, I mean, out of the games I've designed, this feels like light or medium light. This feels like I mean, like you've a, designed Pax Mir. And- <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I, but, like, for me, I mean, it was a real departure because it was, like, as a general audience, I want to go, like, way on the light end. So I'm, like, it's, like, midweight Euro, like, your next game after Small World or Seller's Catan right. or something. Right. Um, that was what I was aiming for. And then when I did a stream of Root with the heavy cardboard team, they, during the play, they're like, oh, this is like kind of a heavy game. This has got like a lot of things. So I might have screwed up. And for them to say that is like... (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I mean, it's just like it... I think Root, uh, it's it's in a weird place because I think mechanically you can think about your decisions a lot. But on the other hand, the game is goofy as hell. And you should embrace the silliness of it. Like when, when you're playing, like crazy things are possible. And the stories it can generate are really like all over the map. And this is like if if I had to say like one design goal, like design aesthetic, I'm always shooting for is I want like the widest possible range of narrative uh, construction. Like I want the games to tell really crazy stories uh, yeah. that feel organic. And I think Root like hits that mark in ways that like make it hard to define it as like a medium weight or a heavyweight game. Mm. Okay, well, I'm definitely starting to flag a little bit over here. So yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you late. so much. Late. This has been really, really fun. Harrison, thank you so much for pitching awesome. in. I really appreciate it. Yeah, this was real fun. Thanks, guys. As I said you know, in my email, um, I was really happy to hear a podcast that does some stuff on strategy because it's, it's as or more interesting than the actual uh, game design stuff. I know, like we in the review stuff. It's like, I mean, we're doing like we're we're covering Gen Con right now. It's like this big six part series review Gen Con games, and that's cool. But I want to get to play. (laughs) Like this is this is playing right now, you know. And we like we know Root's gonna be good. We're gonna hear Root. We're gonna hear about Root five years from now. I I I I, I hope so. (laughs) We we it's it's I I think. It's going to be one of those games because we've had like a wave of games over the last couple of years. We're talking side Terra from Mars, it's Seven Wonders Duel to a lesser extent. That has kind of invaded the top of BGG, the rankings, like that top 10 area. Yeah. I really think Root is headed there. I really think I wouldn't be surprised if this time next year Root is like the number five game on that'd, BGG. Yeah, that'd be a crazy, crazy thing. It's so funny because like, like you know, I'm doing the second edition of Premiere right now and I've been so happy. Like it's succeeded like way beyond my expectations, and I really love that design. Um, and I just keep thinking, like, is this like Root is letting me do a really cool edition of this game? <laughs> matters a lot to me. And yeah. if nothing else, like I'm into that. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's also, it's it, you know, it's it, it's it's a funny thing to see it blow up so much. But I, I, I'm happy for it. That's really awesome, man. Well, thank you so much, Cole. Well, uh, hopefully, we can reach out to you in a little bit and uh, yeah, get, uh, get some other stuff going. All right, sweet. Nice. Take care. All right, well, gentlemen. Have a good yeah. day. Yeah, you too. Take care. Bye.